too much. So I'm going to try to cover what I think will be the most important hard hitting. Let's talk a little bit about Allah, his characteristics and that Allah worships and prays. And then that will segue into the Quran. Yes. So we're going to talk about Allah's characteristics and Allah worships and prays. And that will be a segue into the Quran by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because there's too much. And then when we deal with the Quran, I don't know if we'll be come up now. We'll then look at the black stone and pretty much that will be the annihilation, decimation, the obliteration of Islamic Tawheed. Now, remember, Sam, this could be another part. So no, of no course, there's going to be another part. Believe me, I already know that. That's I'm not going to finish this today. Okay. So with your permission, there is going to be another part. Absolutely. Because I, I don't even know if I'll make it to the Quran yet. That means there has to be a part on the Quran. Yeah. So it'll be a series that you can then create a playlist for the benefit yeah. of others. Now, let me get you the article that goes with this one. If I can find it, there's too many articles. Hold on. Oh, boy. Yeah. Hold on. Let me. Oh, here it is. The article is Islam portrays Allah as a finite, limited, temporal, embodied soul. Let me repeat it. I'm going to give you the link. I'll share it on Clubhouse or pin it and I'll share it on YouTube. Yep. Islam portrays Allah as a finite, limited, temporal, embodied soul. <clears throat> and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So my friend, I'm sending it to you. You guys keep busting my eardrums because I got my earplugs on. There it is right there on Facebook. I sent it to you. And for those of you on YouTube, here it is. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you can make a very strong case on the grammar of the Quran that the Quran depicts Allah as an embodied being. He, he is a soul. He has a soul. He breathes out the spirit and he has a body. The problem is that most Muslims don't believe Allah is a body. Now, when you deal with Sunni Islam, you have the Salafi Muslims like Uthman. They call themselves the Salaf Asali. They do believe that Allah has a body. They, they won't say it's a body per se. They'll say these are his characteristics and attributes. This is why not too long ago, there was a South Asian brother that had visited Uthman. And I think the brother here was there. The one here that was asking me a question, the one who has a booth, he was here, right? Yeah, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony. I think you know what I'm talking about when that South Asian brother asked him about Allah's leg and shin, and was it does it is it attached to his butt and all that? <coughs> Uthman, yes. that's I think that was his friend, right? Yeah. Okay, so Uthman admitted, Allah has a shin, has a foot, he has eyes, he has two right hands. These are his attributes. They're unlike anything in creation. We don't know how. Now that is the position of the set of what they call the set of Saleh, meaning those who follow the first three generations of Muslims. They say this teaching was taught by Muhammad and his companions and their followers and their followers after them, because there are authentic narrations attributed to Muhammad where he says the best generation of Muslims is my generation. Then the generation after that, and then the generation after that. And then after that, then it will be divided. So according to these authentic traditions, the first three generations of Muslims are the best. Muhammad and his companions called Sahaba. Now their followers, and I'm not trying to sound impressive, but these are the technical terms. They're called the Tabi'in. The Tabi'in. Those are not Sahaba. A Sahabi is a companion who met, saw Muhammad. If you didn't see Muhammad, but you saw and followed his companions, you're a, ta a Tabi. A Tabi. So a Tabi'in. And then a Tabi, a Tabi'in. The followers of the followers of the companions. So the first three generations. So according to Uthman and according to those who are Salafi, they say that the first three generations of Muslims did not allegorize these characteristics. They didn't say, oh, Allah's hand doesn't mean he has a hand. It means power. They affirmed these attributes of Allah without explaining them. Yes, he has a hand, but we don't ask how. We just say he has a hand and he has eyes and so on and so forth. Now, the other Muslims who have been influenced by philosophy because there was an intrusion of Greek philosophy and logic because as the Muslim empire expanded and it attacked peoples, it also took over their sources, their writings. And a lot of people don't know this. This is a fact, guys. Please don't take anything I say for granted because I could be mistaken. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to perfect my ability to recall the facts clearly. And if I make a mistake, may the Spirit correct that error in me, save you from it. But do fact check me, because I'm not, you know, obviously, I'm 
far from perfect. I'm more perfect than Avery, but that's another story, right? According to Islamic sources and history, when the Muslims conquered Christian lands, the Christians had translated the writings of the Greek philosophers, logicians, and their medical experts into Syriac and or Arabic. So they had already preserved the writings of Aristotle and Plato and also the Greek physicians like Hippocrates uh, and Galen, right? Galanic medicine. They had rendered their writings into Syriac and or Arabic. So when the Muslims took over, they discovered these writings and it spawned the Islamic sort of civilization. And a lot of Muslims, because they started reading the writings of Aristotle, you know, their Aristotelian logic, they became rationalists and they started allegorizing or explaining away a lot of the statements in the Quran. And this group that I'm speaking in particular were known as the Mutazilites, Mutazili. And this, this group will be important when we discuss the Quran a little later. But due to the influence of Greek philosophy and logic, this also impacted Sunni Muslims, <clears throat> such as those who claim to be Ashari or Maturidi, the Ash Ashaira, Ashaira or the Ashari or the Maturidi. These are the ones who say these statements of Allah's eyes, hands, they're allegorical, they're not literal. So there is a huge fight within Sunni Islam between the Salafis on one hand and the Ashkaris, what they call the Ashaira, sorry for butchering the Arabic, I have a hard time speaking English, the Maturidis. So the Salafis accuse them, the Ashkaris and Maturidis, of perverting traditional Islam and diverging from the Islam taught by Muhammad's companions, their followers and the followers after them, because they did not allegorize these characteristics. They took them for granted and affirmed them without saying how. So there's a debate. So if you talk to a Hamza Yusuf, he'll tell you, no, Allah does not have eyes. Eyes, that's metaphor for his seeing. Allah doesn't have hands. Hands, that's a metaphor for his power. They allegorize them. The Maturidis and the Asharis. And Hamza Yusuf is an example. Yasser Qadi, I don't know where he stands. He used to be a diehard you know, Salafi, but he's changed his views over the years. So who is the Salafi? Uthman. Who's the Salafi? Sheikh Asim al-Hakim. Who's the Salafi? Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Who's the Salafi? Well, again, these individuals. But Hamza Yusuf, Zayed Shakir, Nuha Mim Keller, these others, they're not Salafis. And the Shia definitely do not take these attributes literally. They don't. They allegorize them. So keep that in mind when I share this, because these arguments work powerfully against the Salafis, such as Uthman. But with the Asharis or the Maturidis, and they're very similar, they're virtually identical, right? It doesn't work, they allegorize them. So you either have to show them contextually, grammatically, you cannot allegorize them, you have to take them literally, right? Otherwise, these arguments will be a waste of your time in trying to bring up against the Asharis, the Maturidis, like Hamza Yusuf, is that clear? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Is that clear? So if that's clear, what I'm about to show you will only work with an Uthman, right? And all those who are Salafis. Now, that doesn't mean the Quran doesn't teach that Allah is embodied. It does. But these Muslims explain them away, the Asharis and Amaturidis. So keep that in mind. So let's go into what the Quran says about Allah's attributes, what I call body parts. They don't like to say body parts. They say attributes. Right. According to the Quran, and the Sunnah of Muhammad, Allah has at least three hands. To our right, one is left. Allah has at least three eyes. Allah has a waist and gonads. That's why he wears a waist sheet and his ar. Allah also has feet, at least one foot we know of, and a shin. And so he looks like a grotesque monster. Okay, so let's begin. And I'm just reading from my paper. First, Allah appears as a beautiful man. Are we ready? From the Quran and the Sunnah. We got go. You guys ready? All right. Yes, sir. So here you go. And by the way, these are sound narrations. They're deemed sahih. These are not da'if. Da'if, brother. Da'if. 
Okay, now this comes from the English translation of Al Tirmidhi that's found on alam.org, but they have a more recent English translation of Tirmidhi done by Darus Salam, which is a Salafi publication that's found on sunnah.com. So I quote both versions. So here you go. Allah appears as a beautiful man. Al Tirmidhi Hadith number 237, and I give you the link where you can read these online. Narrated, narrated Abdul Rahman ibn Aish. Allah's Messenger said, I saw my Lord, wow. the exalted and glorious, in the most beautiful form. The most beautiful form. I think I have a typo. I think, let me see if it's mine or is it original. I think it's mine. I have to then. Yep. I forgot to omit. Anyway, that's fine. He said, what do the angels, so his Lord asked him, what do the angels in the presence of Allah contend about? I said, thou art the most aware of it. You know more than I do. He then placed his palm, so Allah has a palm, between my shoulders, and I felt its coldness in my chest. Hmm. So Allah appears as a man, and he has a physical hand, and his physical palm physically touches Muhammad, and he feels the coolness of Allah's physical palm. Wow. And I came to know what is in the heavens and the earth. He recited, thus did we show Ibrahim the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, and it was so that he might have certainty. Darimi reported in a Mursal form, and Tirmidhi also reported. Now they'll say, well, it's not Sahih. Yes, it is. Here you go. This comes from the Dawud Salam version, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. This also, I'm quoting the versions from Alam and then the Dawud Salam. So this too is an Alam version, another one, right? <clears throat> this one, the grading is given in the Alam. This is Al Tirmidhi Hadith number 245. Too many versions to quote from, but I try to quote both versions. Darus Salam and the Alam version of these hadiths. Narrated Muad bin Jabbal. Muad bin Jabbal. Allah's Messenger was detained one morning from observing the dawn prayer. Along with us till the sun had almost appeared on the horizon. He then came out hurriedly and iqama for prayer was observed and he conducted it in brief form. When he had concluded the prayer by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, he called out, to us saying, remain in your places as you, as you were. Then turning to us, he said, I'm going to tell you what detained me from you on account of which I could not join you in the prayer. What detained me this morning? I got up in the night and performed ablution and observed the prayer as had been ordained for me. I dozed in my prayer till I was overcome by sleep and lo, I found myself in the presence of my Lord, the blessed and the glorious in the best form. He said, Muhammad, I said, at thy service, Labeka, my Lord. He said, what these highest angels contend about? I said, I do not know. He repeated it thrice. He said, then I saw him put his palms up between my shoulder blades till I felt the coldness of his fingers between the two sides of my chest. So Allah has a shape, has physical hands, Physical fingers, physical palms. And Allah touched Muhammad with his physical palms and Muhammad felt the coolness of his fingers and his palms. Everyone catching that before I move yeah. on? Yeah. Then everything was illuminated for me and I could recognize everything. He said, Muhammad, I said, at thy service, my Lord. He said, what do these high angels contend about? I said, in regards to expiations, how to expiate your sins. That's what the angels are arguing about, right? Yep. He said, what are these? I said, going on foot to join congregation prayer. So if you go to perform Juma prayer, Juma Salah, then you'll be forgiven of your sins. Sitting in the mosque after the prayers, you'll be forgiven your sins. Perform ablution well, despite the difficulties. He again said, then what do they contend? I said, in regard to the ranks. He said, what are these? I said, providing a food. You want a higher rank? Provide food. Speaking gently, observing the prayer when the people are asleep. He again said to me, beg your Lord and say, Oh Allah, I beg of thee power to do good deeds and abandon abominable deeds to love the poor that thou forgive me and show me mercy, show mercy to me. And when thou intends to put people to trial, thou causes me to die unblemished. And I beg of thee, thy love and the love of one who loves thee and the love for the deed, which brings me nearer to thy love. Allah's messenger said, it is a truth. So learn it and teach it. Now, what's the grading? Transmitted by Ahmed Tirmidhi, who said this is a Hassan Sahih Hadith. Good, sound Hadith. Mm. And I asked Muhammad Ibn Ismail about this Hadith, and he said it is a Sahih Hadith. Now I give you the other versions of these same two Hadiths, 
from Darul Salaam. We don't need to read them. But what's the grading? Here it is. It's here in this one that I quote, Hassan. Yes. So now, folks, according to the sound narration tribute of Muhammad, Muhammad's God, Lord, appears as a man. And in that form, he has hands, palms, and fingers that physically touched Muhammad. And Muhammad physically felt the touch of Allah's physical hands, palms, and fingers and felt they were cool. So the Salafis would have to say this is Allah's actual shape. This is Allah's actual attributes. Yeah. Now the Ashari and Maturidi or Shia would say, well, no, Allah can appear in visible shape. He can appear in a visible form. All right. Well, then if Allah can appear in visible form, then why can't Allah then appear as a man and become a man without ceasing to be God and appear as the man Christ Jesus? Exactly. So what's your problem with God becoming a man? If he can appear as a man, why can't he become a man without ceasing to be God? What's the problem? Can you Muslims help me? I know there are no Muslims here who can answer, but you get the point? I get the point, sir. They, but have if you're, no, they have no argument against the, the incarnation with stuff like this. No. And if they believe this is Allah's actual characteristics, attributes, now you have a problem. And I'm going to hammer that a little later. What's the problem? If Allah has a shape, and this is his eternal shape, because the Salafis say Allah really possesses these qualities as actual characteristics. He has hands, he has fingers. They say they're actual, unlike anything in creation. We don't know how he has them. They're unlike anything creation, but he has fingers, he has hands. They affirm this. Uthman affirms this. The Salafis affirm this. Well, that means Allah has a body. Well, if he has a body, the body can only be so big, it can't be infinite. Well, if it's so big, that means Allah's body must occupy space, place, must occupy location, must yep. occupy space and place. Well, if Allah's body is uncreated, that means the space and the place that Allah's body by necessity needs to exist in must be uncreated as well. You see the problem? Yes. <laughs> wow. Now, I've got to unpack this if you don't understand the problem. For Allah to have a shape that is actual, eternal, unlike anything creation. Well, that's not saying anything because even my hand as unlike the hand of a gorilla. Right. right? I agree. My feet are like the feet of a dog, right? That's right. That's true of everything. You can say that of everything. My body parts are unlike the body parts of any other creature that's not human, correct? Correct. And if we go by what science says, even our fingerprints, fingerprints are unique because no two humans have the same fingerprints. Yeah. So to say that Allah's body parts, though they don't like to call it body parts, are unlike anything creation? Okay. The dog's feet are like cat feet, right? Right. Unlike tiger's feet. So what are, what are you saying? You're not saying anything. You're just affirming that Allah's physical. Or at least he has a shape, a body of some kind. It may not be made of the substance of the earth or the substance of heaven, but he has a body. Now, here's the dilemma. You Christians got to learn this argument. If Allah has a body that's uncreated because he's always possessed hands, fingers, foot, waist, eyes, right? then this body of his needs space and place to dwell in. Yes. Well, the space and place that he dwells in must also be uncreated if his body parts are uncreated, right? Right. Therefore, this space and place that all dwells in, he did not create. Mm -hmm. He's always existed in it. And it must be bigger than his body in order for his body to be contained in it. Wow. Right? That's right. Because... Yeah. For, uh, for example, I can't fit in my car if I'm bigger than my car. Right. So for Allah to have these characteristics, which we will call bo a body, even though they don't like to use the term.
in space and place. Well, that space and, and, and place must be bigger than his body. Otherwise, it cannot contain his body. So that space and place must also be uncreated, which means there are certain parts of creation. Well, you can't even call it creation. See, that's an oxymoron. Yeah. There are certain spaces and places that Allah did not create that are just as old as him. But if he did not create them, he can't control them. He doesn't own them. In fact, they own him because they contain him. This is tough. This is heavy, Sam. Now, you don't want to move on unless everyone else gets it. I see on YouTube. Yeah, that we right. got it. We know that the way we're going to pursue that, that's amazing. Uh, Sam, amazing that we yep. learned a lot. Yes. Yeah, do not let him get away with it, man. Because, okay, where does this body? Is it, it's got to be somewhere. Somewhere, yes. Okay. Because a body, by its very nature, must have volume, size, and shape. If you have volume, size, and shape, then you need place and space. Well, the place and space that contains Allah's characteristics must be large enough for Allah to be contained therein. But if these characteristics are eternal, then that space and place are eternal. So he didn't create them. He doesn't own them. They contain him. Yeah, this is going to be a rough time for my man. <laughs> it's going to be. I'm going to have a quick time over there, man. It's going to be rough, Anthony. It's going to be rough for them. I know I'm going to be rough now. <laughs> yep. So uh, let's go through uh, other examples of Allah's body parts. It's all from my article, guys. It's all there, free of charge. You go study them and use them for the glory of the triune God. Now, let me see something. Hold on. I lost my place. Yep. Sorry, guys. Did I do something? I lost my place in that. What are you looking at? Oh, no, I clicked on the wrong way. Sorry, buddy. I'm right. Allah wears a garment. Okay, watch this. <laughs> Just a, No, honestly, I'm not lying to you. <laughs> You're laughing, dude. It's true, man. Allah wears a garment. I am not oh, lying. Yeah, yeah, just That's funny, man. That's I, funny. They will be, they're going to cry. They're going to cry when they're going to Just the capper. No, no way. Just... Buddy, I'm telling you, this is from their sound sources. Allah wears a garment. Wow. Yeah, and in fact, the hadith says, that the, the womb, there's a primordial womb that is aware, that is cognizant, a womb that's living, conscious, and alive, that grab Allah by his gonads. I'm not lying here. I'm going to read it for you. Sad Bukhari, volume 6, book 60, number 354, Allah wears a garment. Now, there's a particular version of Hadith that says the womb didn't grab his waist, sheet his garment but grabbed his loins his gonads <laughs> but due to the embarrassing nature of that statement they watered down by saying that the womb grabbed allah's garment his waist garment his izar okay let me read it okay narrated abu huraira the prophet said allah created his creation and when he had finished it the womb so according to islam there's a primordial womb an ancient womb, the precursor to all other wombs that was created at the beginning of creation. This womb got up and caught hold of Allah. You get it? It caught hold of Allah. It grabbed Allah. What is it grabbing if Allah is bodiless? Whereupon Allah said, what is the matter? So Allah is having a conversation with a living, conscious, cognizant womb. What is the matter? On that it said, I seek refuge with you from those who sever the ties of kith and kin. On that Allah said, will you be satisfied if I bestow my favors on him who keeps your ties? So imagine this, Allah's having a conversation with a womb. And hold my favors from him who severs your ties? On that it said, yes, O my Lord. So it's even calling Allah my Lord. Then Allah said, that is for you. Abu Huraira added, now this is the commentary, the exposition, the interpretation of Muhammad of chapter 47, 22 of the Quran. Abu Huraira added, if you wish, you can recite. Would you then, if you were given the authority to do mischief in the land and sever your ties of kinship? So the San Hadith quotes Muhammad explaining 47.22 of the Quran. Here's another one. Tafsir ibn Kathir. And this is again his exposition of chapter 47 verse 22. Al-Bukhari recorded from Abu Huraira that Allah's messenger said, now watch this version. After Allah completed creation, the creation, right? The womb stood up 
and pulled at the lower garment of the most merciful. So Allah's wearing a garment at the start of creation? No. <laughs> and now what is happening? This is in the heaven or in the earth? I have no clue where the heck this is taking place, man. Okay, but watch what, uh, what Allah does by reaction. Look at his reaction. He said, stop that. In other words, it grabbed Allah by his gonad so hard. He said, stop that. It replied, my stand here is a stand of one seeking refuge in you from severance of ties. Allah said, would it not? Please you that I join whoever joins you and sever whoever severs you. It replied, yes, indeed. He said, you are granted that. Now, here's what's even more mind-blowing. This womb that Allah created at the start of creation, it's a primordial womb that is alive, conscious, can speak, can grab, grabs Allah by his waist sheet. So can I ask a question? If Allah doesn't have gonads, why is he wearing a waist sheet? This is underwear to cover your gonads. So why is Allah wearing it? Do you catch it? It's right there. I'm not making it up. It says, it grabbed Allah by the lower garment and pulled on it. <laughs> a lower garment is a waist sheet that you wear to cover your gonads so people don't see your private parts. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, man. It's right there. Here, you can even go to my article and click on it because here, it's there online. Okay, we have to test this. <clears throat> but they have to believe it. Problem is that they deny it. Everything they deny it. No, no, say, oh, no, it doesn't mean that. No, no but it's Bukhari. No, friend, it says, Ibn Kathir is quoting Bukhari. Yeah, but you don't know the Arabic, you see. <laughs> okay, so then the Muslim who translated doesn't know the Arabic either. All right. <laughs> I can't do that. What's wrong, man? What happened to you, bro? We're having a fun, man. We're having a fun. <laughs> so everyone getting this? Because it's going to get a little worse. Okay. Right? Because you think that's bad. Okay, as you see it, you'll see it's right there. I'm quoting it. And then it says, where is this womb now? Verily, the womb is attached to the throne. So right now, above the seven heavens, there's a womb attached to Allah's throne. So it's there enthroned with Allah. And connecting its ties does not mean dealing evenly with the kinfolk, but it rather means that if one's kinfolks sever the ties, he connects them. This hadith was also recorded by Al-Bukhari. Ahmed also recorded from Abdullah bin Amr that Allah's messenger said, the womb will be placed on the day of resurrection. So not only is the womb with Allah attached to his throne, it will appear on the day of resurrection, curved like a spinning wheel, speaking with an eloquent fluent tongue. The real miracle is that people think this stupid religion is a miracle. Whoa. Calling to severing whoever had severed it and joining whoever had joined it. So now notice Islam. You have a womb that talks, walks, and stands that appear on the day of judgment, speaking with an eloquent tongue. You have a black stone that will be given eyes and a mouth to speak. And it's Allah's right hand on earth. And we'll get to that a little later. That was white when it came from Allah. But when the people kissed it, it turned black because it would suck up their sins. And that black stone will intercede for anyone who touched it and kissed it. And then you have the crown that's going to appear as a living conscious entity. And it's individual surahs as flocks of birds. More, more on that later. And yet they still want to convince us Islam is pure monotheism. Yes, alhamdulillah. And whoever doesn't get it, your hearts are just poisoned. That's you all. get it? Ah. Okay, so Allah has a lower garment, a waist sheet, and a zar. Now ask the Muslims, why do you wear a lower garment? To cover your gonads, your genitalia. So why is your God Allah wearing one? And why is the womb yanking on his gonads? You see, now everyone with me so far, right? Let's, we got a little more. Now Allah has shins and feet, which means he must have legs, right? Here you go, Sahil Bukhari, volume nine. Book 93, number 532S. It's right there. I give you the links, guys. It's in the article. We've shared the links already. And we'll share it again. Narrated Abu Sayyid al Khudri. Then the Almighty will come to them in a shape other than the one which they saw the first time. And they'll say, I am your Lord. And they will say, You are not our Lord. Now, notice this Allah can change shapes. He's a shape shifter. So this body has, He's able to manipulate it and change the way it looks. He's a shape shifter. 
Uh-huh. So on the day of judgment, he's going to deceive Muslims by appearing in a different shape by which they would recognize him. Right. So when he appears in this different shape, they go, you're not our Lord. So then what does he say? Watch this. How are they going to recognize him? Okay. All right. So, and none will speak to him then but the prophets. And then it will be said to them, do you know any sign by which you can recognize him? What's the sign that you're going to know this is your Lord? They will say the shin. And so Allah will then uncover his shin. Now, for him to uncover his shin, that means his shin is covered. Covered by what? His garment. Why would you need to uncover your shin if your shin is laid bare? Because he has a lower garment, a waist sheet. You catching it? Yeah. But my confusion is, how the hell do, do they know what Allah's shin looks like? Because they were asked by the prophets, how are you going to recognize your Lord by the shin? Well, how do you know what his shin looks like? You've never seen it before. Right? But now someone said, well, no, here it means the prophets are asked by what sign you recognize him. Oh, by the shin, because they saw his shin. Mm. Really? I thought that no one can see Allah in this world, they can only see him in the afterlife. So when in, when did the prophet see Allah's shin? Even when Muhammad was taken throughout the seven heavens according to tradition, when they asked Muhammad, did you see your Lord? He goes, how can I see him? He's light. All he saw was light. So how do the prophets recognize this shin? Mm-hmm. You see the problems? Yeah. Right? You see all these problems? Yeah. Okay, so when he uncovers the shin, is it a hairy shin or does he shave? No, seriously. I mean, because he's got a shin, huh? In fact, I suspect Allah shaves his shin. Let me explain why I say that. You often hear Muslims either say, when they say Allah, they'll say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Glory, glorified be he and exalted is he. Glorified and exalted is he. Or they will say, Allah Azwajal, Azwajal. Now for the life of me, I always wondered why they said Azwajal. Now I figured out that is an Arabic transliteration of the English, Allah as with gel. Gel, yep. <laughs> so in reality, Azwajal are English words transliterated to Arabic. It literally means Allah as with gel because Allah has special gel produced from the trees of Jannah, paradise, by which he shaves his shin. Not by my shinny shin shin. No. <laughs> no, Allah. I was stuck for the law. You're going to get stuck for Allah? All right. Now, so he's going to uncover his shin, whereupon every believer will prostrate before him, and there will remain those who used to prostrate before him just for showing off and for gaining good reputation. Now, what about his foot? Sahih Bukhari, volume 6, book 16, number 371. Mary Anas, the prophet said, the people will be thrown into the hellfire and it will say, are there any more to come? Chapter 50, verse 30. Till Allah puts his foot over it. So now notice, everything speaks in Islam. Wounds speak, hell speaks. Fasting will appear <clears throat> speaking. The stone speaks. What in the world doesn't speak? And speak for crying out loud. Yeah, it speaks. Man. Even hell will be saying, more, more, is there any more? And what will Allah do to shut its mouth? Put its foot in it. So Allah puts his foot over it, and it will say, Kati, Kati, enough, enough, shut up, man. Now, guys, you've heard of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. That ever should believe in him should not perish, but everlasting life. Yeah. But you do not know that Allah sacrificed his foot for the salvation of Muslims. For Allah so loved the Muslims that he placed his foot in hell so that whoever believes in his shin would not burn in hell but have everlasting life. So what did Allah do to shut up hell from consuming more people? He sacrificed his foot. He loved the ummah so much that he put his foot on hell to shut it up. Alhamdulillah. So that means Allah's foot will suffer the heat of hellfire forever and ever and that's the price Allah paid for the salvation of Muslims. For Allah loved you so much that he gave his foot for you. Uh. 
Are you seeing it? That's tough, man. Hey, t- no, that's the great love of Allah. Deep, you sinner. Henry. Henry. Yo, yeah. Make sure you bring some security guard with you next time when you come and you're going to talk these things, okay? Man, uh, are we sure <laughs> that they're going to even be there, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't took over the hood now. That's our hood now, Anthony. That's you caught it, friend, folks? Yes. Let me repeat. Allah so loved you Muslims that he sacrificed his foot so that now his foot will suffer the heat of hellfire of the Nar forever and ever because he placed his foot to shut it up. That's how much he loved you, Muhammadan. Abdul Rahman, that's how much Allah loved you, Aisha. That's how much Allah loved you, as with hair gel. <laughs> okay. Somebody said that they, Muhammad was on the magic mushies. Shrooms. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, he had a lot of shrooms. All right. Okay. So, some more stuff, guys. Again, I'm gonna have to do at least two more parts with your permission because you know there's too much stuff to cover. Sam, you know this is this got to be a permanent thing and if, with your permission. You, we got to do this. Yeah. Well, I, well, I'm gonna give you enough ammo that you can create a playlist and you got all the articles and rebuttals. You don't need to look for them. It's there. All you need to do is now use them. But like he said. Pray for miraculous divine protection because now the Muslims are going to start threatening you. I'm not kidding. But we don't fear because our lives in the hands of Jesus, our lives are not in the hands of Muslims. And they want you to fear and cower away because then they know it works and they're going to use bullying tactics. We don't. We stand up to the bullies by the power of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people who read the Arabic will confirm that the Arabic terms used for Allah's eyes, because in Arabic you have singular, dual, and plural. And the Arabic term used for Allah's hands, because in Arabic, you have singular, dual, and plural. There are places in the Quran where the plural is used for eyes and hands, meaning three or more. Three or more. I'm now going to prove to you that Allah has at least three hands. Two right hands and a left one. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Here it is. Sahih Muslim. Allah has two right hands, one and, and a left one, along with fingers. I remember Muhammad even said he felt... The palms and the fingers. Well, here you go. Sai Muslim, book 39, number 6704. Abdullah bin Omar reported Allah's messenger saying, Allah, the exalted and glorious, would fold the heavens on the day of judgment and then he would place them on his right hand and say, I am the Lord. Where are the haughty and where are the proud today? He would fold the earth, placing it on the left hand and say, I am the Lord. Where are the haughty and where are the proud today? Okay, so here he has a right and left hand. Okay. Well, watch this one. This comes from Sunan Nasai, right? Sunan Nasai. <clears throat> English translation, volume 6, book 49, hadith 5381. And it's graded Sahih. Sahih, guys. It's Sahih. So they can tell you, Daif Jittan, brother. Book 49, the book of etiquettes of judges. Chapter 1, virtue of the judge who is just in passing judgment. It was narrated from Abdullah bin Amr, bin al-As, that the Prophet said, those who are just and fair will be with Allah most time, the thrones of light at the right hand of the most merciful, those who are just in their rulings and in their dealings with their families, and those of whom they are in charge. Muhammad, one of the narrators, said in this hadith, and both of his hands are right hands. So wait, he's got two right hands? But Muslims said he has a right hand and a left. No wonder it's hands in Arabic, plural, three or more. Because he's got two right hands and a left one. Takbir! Okay, everyone with me? Can you guys hear me? I'm coughing, Sam. They deactivated me again, my brother. But uh, you're 100% correct. So the Arabic term for ayun, ayun is a plural. When you say ayun, it means one eye. And ad, ad is a plural. Yep. Yes, exactly, brother. And in Arabic, it uses the plural, three or more. So in Arabic, it's actually a right hand. You would say, yet, the singular. But when you read... He's cutting up, brother. Yeah, yeah, Captain, you're cutting up, my man. Yeah, Yeah, you're cutting up, brother. You're, You're chopping up your sound. Or let me read the let me read the other hadith about his fingers. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, Sal Bukhari, volume on book ninety three, number five ten. <clears throat> this is all Sal Bukhari, volume on book number three, number five ten. Narrated Abdullah, 
A Jew came to the Prophet and said, Oh Muhammad, Allah will hold the heavens on a finger, and the mountains on a finger, and the trees on a finger, and all the creation on a finger. And then he will say, I am the king. On that, Allah's apostle smiled till his premolar teeth became visible and then recited, No just estimate have they made of Allah such as due to him. Chapter 39, verse 67. That's of the Quran. Abdullah added, Allah's apostle smiled at the Jew's statement, expressing his wonder and belief in what he what, what was said. So Muhammad affirmed it. He smiled. Yep, he's got fingers, he's got hands, two right hands and a left. And did you know what? You guys want to hear what's even more freaky? Allah yes. will actually shake Umar ibn al-Khattab's hand on the day of judgment. <whistles> what a mark! Now this is a daif hadith, but don't let them deceive you. In Islamic sciences, the sciences of hadith, daif means it passed. It was authentic enough they could not reject it and toss it out, so they had to include it. Secondly, daif hadiths can be used to encourage good behavior, good practices, virtuous acts, but daif hadiths are not used for legal verdicts so again let me remind you christians because some muslims will deceive you and i'm going to play a clip from hamza yusuf a daif hadith means it passed it is good enough that the muslims could not toss it out lest they were tossing out a genuine statement of muhammad so they had to include it it means it passed so the muslim scholars say you can use daif to encourage good behavior good etiquette good virtues cultivating good virtues but you can't use daif hadith for legal verdicts. But don't let the Muslims tell you daif, that means it's not reliable. They're lying through their teeth. Now, I don't know if I can play this. Maybe you can play it. Well, if you play something on YouTube, could they hear it? Anyway, you can search no. on YouTube. Do Hamza Yusuf, I'll get you the link. Hamza Yusuf daif hadith. And you're going to see, he says, it passed. Daif doesn't mean it. it's unreliable it's not trustworthy it means it passed it's reliable you can't reject it here it is i'm going to give it to you guys you can listen to it later because we can't play it now here it is folks i'm going to give it to you in the youtube section here it is guys the link listen to it let me see if i gave you our brother's link no i gave you takia watch all right that's it anyway that's fine now i'm going to send it to you on facebook okay brother Yep, I got you. Here I'm waiting for it. So don't let them deceive you, folks. Daif means it passed. It means it could not be re rejected. It had to be included. So you can use daif hadith, weak hadith, to encourage and cultivate good behavior, good etiquette, good virtues, but you cannot use them for legal verdicts. That's what Muslim scholars say, which Uthman and them will not tell you because they're hoping you don't know. You get my point? They're hoping you don't know. So now, let me read the hadith. It was narrated at Sunan Ibn Majah, the book of the Sunnah. It was narrated that Ubay bin Kaab said, watch here, the Messenger Allah said, the first person with whom Allah will shake hands will be Omar. So he's not the only person. He's the first person that Allah will actually, literally physically shake his hand. How does Allah shake anyone's hands if he doesn't have a hand? Anyone help me? Can you help me understand that one? Ah, my brain would hurt if I tried. All right. Right? And he is the first person to be greeted with salam and the first person who will be taken by the hand and admitted into paradise. Great daif. Daif, brother. Not only that, but according to the Muslim sources, Allah laughs. Allah makes fun of people, he mocks people, and he rejoices. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Allah laughs, Allah mocks, Allah rejoices. He mocks you, he'll laugh at you, he'll rejoice over you. I'm not lying, dude, I'm not lying. This is all from the Sunnah. This comes from the English translation, Sunnah Ibn Majah, number 4247. I give you the link to sunnah.com. It was narrated from Abu Huray that the Prophet said, Allah rejoices moreover the repentance of any one of you, then you rejoice over your lost animal when you find it. Great, Sahih. Now here Muhammad stole the words of our Lord in Luke 15. Luke 15, 7 to 10, when they'll be rejoicing in the midst of angels. 
more rejoicing in heaven over one lost, lost individual that's found. So Muhammad stole the words of our Lord Jesus and attributed to his God. Okay? Now watch this. Sunnah Ibn Majah, the book of the Sunnah. Waqi bin Hudus narrated that his paternal uncle Abu Razin said, the Messenger of Allah said, Allah laughs, he laughs. Allah laughs at the despair of his slaves, although he soon changes it. I said, O oh Messenger of Allah, does the Lord laugh? This is why the Ashari and the Maturidi will have a hard time. They cannot explain these statements away. They cannot allegorize them. Because the man in the Hadith asked, you mean Allah laughs, Muhammad? Now Muhammad didn't say, no, stupid. That's an allegory, idiot. So notice again, he asked, incredulously. I said, oh, Messenger Allah, does the Lord laugh? He said, yes. I said, we shall never be deprived of good by a Lord who laughs. How are the Ashari's and the Maturidi's going to explain this away? How are you going to explain away? The Hadith is clear. The man even asked, you mean Allah laughs? And Muhammad said, yes. Well then, we will never despair of a Lord who laughs. Ha ha ha, ho ho ho, who would go? Ha ha ha. Everyone got it? Got it, Sam. <laughs> All right, now let's read some more. This is the greatest Hassan, it's good. Good, okay? Here's another one, Sai Muslim, book one, number 349. He would continue calling upon Allah till Allah, blessed and exalted, would laugh. When Allah would laugh at him, he would say, enter the paradise. So Allah laughs. Another one, Sai Muslim, book one, number 359. Now these are long hadiths, so I'm just giving you the salient part. part. He, the area said, he, the man would say, now the man gets upset. Art thou making fun of me? He's talking to Allah now. So man says, Allah, are you making fun of me? Or art thou laughing at me? Though thou art the king? He, the Neri said, I saw the messenger of Allah laugh till his front teeth were visible. So Muhammad laughed Wait. at the fact that a man's going to say to Allah, who's laughing at him, laughing. <laughs> Allah, you're laughing at me? Don't you know I have low self-esteem? How dare you laugh at me, Allah? <laughs> Okay, Sai Muslim, book one, number 360. He would say, art thou making a fun of me? <laughs> Though thou art the king, I saw the Messenger of Allah lab till his front teeth were visible. Mm. Okay, two more. Okay, Sai Muslim, book one, number 361. Oh my Lord, art thou mocking at me? Though thou art the Lord of the worlds, so you're making fun of me? Ibn Masood laughed. And asked the ears, why don't you ask me what I am laughing at? They then said, why do you laugh? He said, it is in this way that the messenger of Allah laughed. <clears throat> they, the companions, <clears throat> asked, why do you laugh, O Messenger of Allah? He said, on account of the laugh of the Lord of the universe. See, you can't explain these away allegor allegorically. No. Muhammad is laughing because his Lord laughs. He laughed at the idea of Allah laughing and making fun of people. If it's allegorical, there's nothing to laugh about. Right? So on account, I, mom, and I'm laughing on account of the laugh of the Lord of the universe. When he, the desire of paradise said, thou mocking at me though, thou art the Lord of the worlds. He would said, I'm not mocking at you. So Allah tells a, a lie. He's fibbing, Uthman ibn fibbing. I'm not laughing at you. Would I mock you, my servant, as with hair gel? But I have power to do whatever I will. <laughs> Final one, Sai Muslim, book 20, number 4658. It has been narrated on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Messenger of Allah said, God laughs at the two men, both of whom will enter paradise. So he laughs at more than one person. He laughs at many people. He laughs at these two men. Why is he laughing at them? Went to paradise, though one of them kills the other. They said, oh, oh Messenger of Allah, how is it? He said, one of them fights in the way of Allah, the Almighty insulted and dies a martyr. Then God turns in mercy to the murderer who embraces Islam, fights the way of Allah, the Almighty and exalted, and dies a martyr. So what does it mean? I'm an unbeliever and I kill, let's say, a Muslim. That Muslim goes to paradise. I then become a Muslim later on, and Allah forgives me, and I enter paradise, and he looks at both of us. <laughs> i look at you. You're shocked that this guy who killed you is here. <laughs> Don't you know he became a Muslim? <laughs> So are you laughing at the fact that Allah laughs? I'm laughing at the fact that Allah laughs. So you're like Muhammad. Oh my goodness, get stuck for Allah. Oh, no. Because Muhammad laughed at the fact that his Lord laughs. 
Right? In fact, you know what? I think Allah laughs like Dr. Evil because he's evil personified. Right? No way is this Islam for real, man. No, it is, man. Sayyid Muslim, bro. The Sunnis cannot reject this. Ah, did you know that Allah sits on a throne? And because Allah sits on a throne, the this throne actually groans. There is makes a squeaking sound sound from the weight of Allah's butt sitting on it. Here it goes. Mishkat al Masabi, English translation, explanatory notes by Dr. James Robson, which you can read online at Sunnah.com. Right? Volume two. This is book twenty-six, Fitin. And it's chapter 17, the beginning of creation, the mention of the prophets, right? And I'm reading the hard copy, but you can read online, sunnah.com, pages 1226, 1227. Jabir bin Wuttim told that a nomadic Arab came to God's messenger and said, people are suffering distress. The children are hungry, the crops are withered, and the animals are perishing. So ask God, ask Allah to grant us rain, for we seek you as our intercessor with God, and God is our intercessor with you. Now Muhammad flipped. Thereupon the Prophet said, Glory be to God, glory be to God. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. And he continued glory, declaring God's glory to the effect of that was apparent in the faces of his companions. He then said, God's state is greater than that. Woe to you. Do you know how great God is? In other words, don't ever say God intercedes for anybody, with anybody. Now watch this. How great is God, Muhammad? His throne is above the, set of the heavens thus, indicating with his finger something like a dome over him. And it groans. The throne literally makes a groaning sound on account of him as a saddle does because of the writer. Abu Dawood transmitted it. Did you understand what that means? So again, you can't allegorize this because the throne of Allah is literally groaning. Why? Because Allah's weight makes the throne groan. So Allah has a shape that's small enough to fit on a throne has a shape and a body that requires space and place to dwell in. So that means the throne must be bigger than Allah's shape, otherwise Allah can't fit on it. And the space and the place that Allah occupies must be bigger than His shape in His body, otherwise it could not contain Him. Make it, you guys, everyone got it? Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Friday on. Now these statements won't be that authoritative to let's say Sunnis like Hamza Yusuf who's an Ashari or Maturidi, but these statements are taken from Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is considered one of the greatest Muslim scholars by Salafis and they swear by him and they love him. So he, here's what he says, Bayin Talbis al-Jahmiyyah, Bayin Talbis al-Jahmiyyah, volume one, page 101. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah called Sheikh al-Islam stated regarding Allah's body, even though they don't call it a body. But what is it? There is nothing in the book, Sunnah, nor in the statements of the Salaf or Imams of the nation that he is not a body and his features are not a body. Do you understand what Ibn Taymiyyah said? You cannot find any statement from Muhammad, his companions, their followers, that deny that Allah has a body. They didn't say he has, they didn't say he doesn't. So we are silent. You got it? Caught so it. they didn't say he has a body, but they didn't say he doesn't have a body. They were silent, so we are silent. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now here again, Ibn Taymiyyah, al tahsis fi al rad ala asas al taqdis volume 25, page 31. Okay? It is known that the book Sunan Ijma, consensus, majority, didn't say that all the bodies are created. Did you catch it? What did I just say about Allah's body? If he has a body, it's uncreated, right? That's what you said. But look what Ibn Taymiyyah says. Not all bodies are created. Also, they didn't say that Allah is not a body, and nor did any Imam of the Muslims assert such a thing. Therefore, in my abandoning that statement, there isn't any de deviation from neither instinct nor the law. So they didn't say he doesn't have a body, nor did they say all bodies are created. Because if Allah has these attributes, hands and feet, and a shin, and a waist, and eyes, then that means that's a body. Therefore, that body can't be created. So that's what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying. 
They didn't say he didn't have a body. Muhammad and his companions and their followers and the followers after them didn't say he doesn't have a body. They didn't say he does have one, but they didn't say he didn't. And therefore, I would say he has a body, but that body's uncreated because not all bodies would be created if Allah has a body. See the logic? Again, Ibn Taymiyyah. al tahsis fi al-Rad al-Asas al taqdis Volume 3, page 214. We conclude that it was eyesight as it is in the side narration from Kadada, from Ikrama, from Ibn Abbas, who said that the Prophet said, I saw my God, and I read the Hadith, right? Remember Tirmidhi, it's Sahih. But in this version, look at what <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah quotes. I quoted the ones from Tirmidhi, where Muhammad said, I saw my Lord in a beautiful shape. But in this version, look what he says. The Prophet said, I saw my God in image of beardless. He appeared as a beardless man with long curly hair in a green garden. And he has curly hair. Now watch this. This again, I'm not making it up. These are statements attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah. Bayan Talbis and Jahmiya, volume one, page 568. If he, Allah, wants to, he can sit on a mosquito's back. That means Allah can shrink his size small enough to ride a mosquito. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, final one. Now again, others like Hamza Yusuf are not Salafis who don't really swear by Ibn Taymiyyah. They say, well, that's his opinion. We, don't, we reject it. Final one from Ibn Taymiyyah. Maj, Majmu'a al-Fatawa. Majmu'a al-Fatawa. Volume 2, page 76. Allah is able, watch, this is funny. Able to relocate from here to there through rope. So Allah can swing through ropes. Okay? But just, just to be clear, Sam, these sources, because I'm looking at the, the article, these sources uh, are books that are quoting from Ibn Taymiyyah. No, these are Ibn Taymiyyah's works, oh. his books. That's why these are Shias showing you the blasphemy. The Shias oh. saying, Look how blasphemous Ibn Taymiyyah is. Oh. What a blasphemer to say this about Allah. And they're quoting his actual books and giving you the Arabic. Mm. So it's right there, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, these next citations come from a very a work that's considered controversial because it's not really certain if this book comes from the Muslim jurist Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, but the book exists, but they think it's forged. Even if it's forged and it's not from ah Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, it still gives you an idea of what some Sunni Muslims were saying about Allah. So here, Kitab as sunnah volume one, page 301. When he most blessed and exalted sits on the kursi, a squeak is heard like the squeak of a new leather saddle. Now, you know this narration isn't completely <clears throat> fabricated because I just read this from Mishkat al-Masabi. Do you remember that? I just read Mishkat al-Masabi where Muhammad said how great Allah is that when he sits on the throne, it groans. Yeah. But this citation from Kitab al-Sunnah, which is attributed to Ahmed ibn Hanbal, some say it's not from him, it's it's someone else who wrote it that passed it off from him. Still, we find a similar statement in Mishkat al-Masabi, right? Yeah. Okay, now here's another one from the same book, page 294. 294. Allah wrote the Torah from Moses with his hand while leaning back on a rock on tablets of pearls and the screech of the quill could be heard. There was no veil between him and him, between Allah and Mo Moses. Okay. Again, same book, Kitab al-Sunnah, volume 2, page 510. Okay, 510. The angels were created from the light of his two elbows and chest. <laughs> because Allah clothes himself with light. So every body part of his, right, emits light. Body part of his emits light. So everyone got it? Oh man, my ears are killing me. So this is this is coming from the uh, the source that they doubt they have doubt on. Like, yes, but it's still a Muslim work. There's still a book called Kitab al Sunnah. It's there, but they think it was forged and attributed to Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But even if it's forged, the fact still remains there are Muslims who are 
describing Allah in this manner. Right? Now, by the way, others take it as an authentic source. Whether you take it as authentic or not, the fact remains, these are Muslims who are ascribing Allah as having a shape, a body, and that body has weight and mass, so that when he sits on a throne, it squeaks or groans. And the groaning part, I quoted from Mishkat al-Masabi, not from Kitab al-Sunnah. Everyone got it? Before I move on? Got it. Everybody else got it? Y'all with us on the panel? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now let me prove to you that Allah's hands have to be actual, not metaphorical. From the Quran itself, if you go to chapter 38 of the Quran, and you read 75, but if you want to get the context, read 38 verses 71 and 75. Open it up for us and read. Here's why the hands of Allah must be actual hands. They cannot be metaphorical. They can't be. Chapter 38 of the Quran, verses 71 to 75. Okay. It says, I'm going to read it from the Arbery translation. When your Lord said to the angels, See, I am creating a mortal of, of a clay. When I have shaped him and breathed my spirit in him, fall you down bowing before him. Then the angels bowed themselves all together. Stay be pleased. He waxed. He waxed proud and was one of the unbelievers. He said, he, he bleats, what prevented thee to bow thyself before that I created with my own hands? There you go. You see 75? Yep. Now, if hands are metaphorical for the power of Allah, that statement makes no sense because then Allah created everything by his power, right? Right. Yes. But here, he's dignifying Adam by showing how special Adam is. Why didn't you bow to the one that I created with my hands? Yeah, that's good. Good point. Because then you could say, well, hold on, Allah, didn't you create everything with your hands? If your hands means power? Mm -hmm. Unless your hands mean your actual hands. And with Adam, you did something unique. You actually created him with your hands. You did the dirty work and used your hands to create him from stinking mud. That's good. So everyone got it so far before I move on to some other final points? Because we're going to do a part four, God willing. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just give me some feedback, folks. <clears throat> All the Hadiths, Quranic verses are in those links. <clears throat> They're yours. Use them for the glory of Jesus. But any questions for clarification? If not, we'll move on. Guys on YouTube, guys on Clubhouse, what say you? What say you? Type of one if you got it. Type of two if you need him to re, you know, restate what he was saying. All right, we're seeing some ones. Clear sand, full metal. Full All right. Okay, so I want to show you now that Allah has a soul. Now beware of your translations because they won't sell. They won't translate accurately. Thank you, Christian Roots. Well, I'm not the best. You know, I'm second to none. <clears throat> Oh, wow. Want you to be humble, you sinner. I'm testing you to see if you're going to get jealous. <laughs> okay, now go to chapter 5, verse 116. All right. Is this where uh, Allah questions Jesus? Yes, but if you look at the Arabic, and you can't do your Arabic, in the browser that we use, I think I gave it to you, yep. Chrome browser. We have Arabic transliteration. So if you put Arabic, also the transliteration, you're going to see that there, Allah and Jesus both have souls. Allah has a soul and Jesus has a soul. Yeah. I've seen you uh, use this in talking with a, a Muslim live in your channel. It was hilarious. <clears throat> All right. Chapter 5, verse 116. I put both of that up, both of them up there. Okay. I'm going to have to figure out a way to share both this clubhouse screen and this screen without losing the sound. I'm More willing, in time. Yeah. In time. Okay, so, I'm here. <clears throat> read, read, read what it says. Supposedly, Asa, who's supposedly Jesus, what he's going to say to Allah when Allah confronts him with views that we, till this day, we don't know who holds. 
And when God said, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, take me and my mother as gods apart from God? He said, to thee be glory. It is not mine to say what I have no right to. If I indeed said it, you know it, knowing what is within my soul. That's literally Arabic, nafsi, my soul. The word Arabic word is nafs. Yeah. Now it's translate transliterated variously as N A F S. Some would transliterate it as N A P H S. So you know what's in my soul, my nafs. Now what does Jesus say supposedly to Allah? And I know not what is within your soul. Allah has a soul. So Allah has a soul. Allah has a body. He's an embodied soul. And this body must have volume, weight, mass, shape. And if it has volume, weight, mass, shape, it needs space and place to dwell in. But the space and place must be large enough to contain that body. So the space and place are larger than Allah's body. And if Allah's body is uncreated, so are the space and place that Allah's body is located in. So there are certain aspects of space and place that Allah did not create and if he did not create he doesn't own you got it now I got it Sam you I just destroyed Islam just destroyed Tawheed it's gone buddy yeah. it's gone and we, yeah, and we haven't even gotten to the other juicy part. oh dude man we haven't gotten nowhere now we're gonna segue into let me find it for you this I got too many articles on Allah praying. So let me see which one to give you. Because now we're going to segue into Allah praying. Get stuck for Allah, baby. <laughs> la, 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 brother. La, 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 la. Let me find it for you. All right, hold on. Allah worships. Okay, guys, let me just, I got a couple of them. So I want to see which one to give you because there's too many. But I want to give you ones that... Are the hardest hitting okay i'm going to give you one allah worships with the quran allah worships with the quran okay let's begin here it is in youtube i just send it to you and i'm going to send you on facebook my friend mm -hmm. all right guys allah worships the quran now when you ask the muslims your five daily prayers what do those five daily prayers consist of mm -hmm. okay they'll say reciting chapters of the quran so our mandatory prayers, our five daily prayers, necessitate that we recite chapters of the Quran, and in every prayer we must recite Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening. Otherwise, our prayers are invalid. So they worship Allah in praying, in praying through their prayers, and their prayers consist of reciting Quran. Now, let's see if Allah worships like Muslims, does he recite the Quran? Oh, yes, he does. In that article, I quote the Quran, where Muslims are told to worship and pray with the Quran, so that no Muslim will deny this. So here you go. Narrated Abu Huraira. Guys, pay attention. Narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's Messenger said, a thousand years before creating the heavens and the earth, there was no heavens and earth. Allah recited Taha and Yasin. Those are two chapters of the Quran. And when the angels heard the recitation, they said, happy are the people to whom this comes down. Happy are the minds which carry this and happy are the tongues which utter this. Dadami transmitted it. This is from Al-Tirmidhi Hadith, number 660. And I give you the link in that post, right? From alim.org. Here's another version. This comes from sunnah.com. Mishkat al-Masabi, 2148. In book reference, book eight, hadith 39. Again, it's from Dadami. Dadami transmitted it. Eight, the excellent qualities of the Quran. The excellent qualities of the Quran. Abu Huraira, God's messenger, reported God's messenger saying, Abu Huraira reported God's messenger saying, a thousand years before, they create, before creating the heavens and the earth, God recited Taha, that's Quran chapter 20, and Yasin. When the angels heard the recitation, they say, they said, 
Happy are people to whom this comes down. Happy are the minds which carry this, and happy are the tongues which utter this. Okay, I'm really confused. A thousand years before creation of heaven, heaven's the earth, Allah is reciting two chapters of the Quran. Why? I thought reciting the Quran is an act of worship. That's why Muslims, to worship Allah, must pray, and in their prayers, they must recite the Quran. Why is Allah reciting the Quran before the creation of heavens and the earth? That's number one. Number two, how did Muhammad know this took place a thousand years before the heavens and the earth, when before creation, there's no time? How did he measure time before time was created? Right? Isn't time part of creation? Time is a unit of change? Well, before heavens and earth, what's there to change? So how do you measure time before heavens and earth? So a thousand years before heavens and earth? Well, before heavens and earth, there was no creation and therefore there was no time because there is no measurement of change, correct? That is good, Sam. Right? Yeah. Unless we assume that Allah himself exists in time. Wow. <laughs> wow. Time, and for, so first it was space and now it's time. Because if we go by scientific understanding, which Muslims may reject, time is supposed to be a measurement of change, right? A unit of change? Yes. But before heavens and the earth, what was changing? Nothing. But it says a thousand years before the heavens and the earth. Right. Well, that's a measurement of time. That's a prophecy from Muhammad. Oh, that's right. So there was time before time was created. <laughs> Okay, but then I'm really confused. The Hadith says the angels heard him recite. So are we to assume from the Hadith angels and angels were there before the heavens and the earth were created? If so, where did they exist? Heavens and earth, that's the inclusion of all space, place, and time. So if the angels heard Allah reciting Taha and Yasin, a thousand years before the creation of heavens and the earth, where did they dwell? Where were they existing? There was no place. There was no space. Unless Muhammad meant, no, after they were created, they heard Allah recite Taha and Yasin. So that means Allah was reciting Taha and Yasin a thousand years later because he was still reciting it when he created the heavens and the earth and the angels. So Sam, can you tell me how you set this up again? Because I remember you started off saying, asking, uh, why did they, what, when, it, when it comes to their daily prayers, how did you set that up again? Well, think about it. What, when they pray, is the heart of their worship prayer, Salah? Mm -hmm. And when they pray five times a day, what do their prayers consist of? Right. Chapters it's of the Quran. Quran. Yeah. And they have to begin each prayer with Fatiha. Otherwise, it's an invalid prayer, right? That's right. Okay, so the question comes down to, if part of their worship is to pray, and their prayer consists of reciting the Quran, that means reciting the Quran is worship, an act of worship, right? That's right. But, yeah. So a thousand years before the heavens and the earth, what was Allah doing? Worship. Worshiping. Because he's reciting Tahan Yasin, chapters of the Quran. Wow, this is really good. That's, 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 this is stupid that's what it is no this is good because this is gonna look man I, you you didn't see my, you probably haven't seen my last video but i had the, the muslims got mad at me for saying muhammad forgot the quran yeah <laughs> that's really a problem for us man i'm telling you that <laughs> no i said this to people and i've said this to atun tash may the lord preserve her and all of you grant us divine miraculous safety physically right protection and health for his glory to glorify and destroy these cults for many more years until the Lord returns or summons us. I told Hatun, I said, once you learn the material Hatun, you're gonna be so effective that the Muslims will first start avoiding you like the plague. See, it started with you, Uthman doesn't wanna deal with you. Then they'll start slandering you in order to discredit you. Then they'll start threatening you to harm you. And then they'll actually try to carry it out. That's exactly what I said to her. And I say this to everyone, once you learn the material, they will avoid you. They want to have nothing to do with you. That's why Uthman said he doesn't want to debate you anymore, right? It's on record, correct? That's on record. And now the second is to call you a liar, try to find dirt on you to discredit you. And if they can't do that, then they're going to threaten you, threaten to harm you. 
and then someone will try to carry it out. But your life is in the hands of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Jesus is Lord. He's almighty. Do not back down. That's what we, Satan wants you to do. We have been getting threats already. See, there you go. New for us. So that's good. Yeah. And Jesus, our Lord, is worthy, right? That's yes. right. And if we really believe he's real, and he is real, and he's almighty, our lives are in his hands. They can't touch us until the appointed time. That's right. What do you think they're resorting to trying to slander me by taking court documents, sadly, because of divorce, where the lawyers try to make me look like a demon? That's true of anyone who goes through divorce, and I, I pray no one does, but sadly, the world we live in, it happens, where they only quote this, their side to make me look bad because they can't refute me. So if they can't refute me and they can't reach me to kill me, they're going to now try to discredit me. And notice what God does to everyone who attacks the servants of the Lord. And I pray I'm one of them, and I'm not self-deluded, and I'm not arrogant about it. Just recently, Khalil just came out. His ex-wife is following charges. She alleges that he raped a minor, and now he's facing criminal charges for pedophilia. Khalil, Muslim Metaphysian's partner, who's making a career off of blaspheming the Lord Jesus. And you see what's happening with Uthman. He's being exposed like a buffoon, and others that did the same, like Ahmad Didat, whom the Lord left as an invalid for nearly 10 years. You don't mess with God, he's real. And the more you blaspheme him, and the more you try to rob him of his glory, and the more you attack the Bible, and you, the more you harm his servants, he will arise to shame and humiliate you. Yep. Amen. Because our God lives. Amen. And our God is the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, who became flesh and the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. That's great, yes. Okay? That's True why I don't be afraid. He will fight. So we got that part. Now, again, understand the implication. A thousand years before the heavens and the earth, well, before the heavens and the earth, there is no space, there is no place, there is no time. So how do you measure time before time was created? So that's an, a one problem. Then it says angels heard it. So does that mean the angels were there before the heavens and the earth? Well, how could they be there when they're part of creation and they could not exist before the heavens because the heavens were created for them to dwell in? So what's going on here? The, can anyone make sense out of this? Right? Not even all of his messenger can make sense out of this. Now, with that said, let's talk about Allah's prayers. Right? Allah's prayers. Hold on, let me get you this other article. Oh, it's a different one. Oh, yeah, yeah I got too many, man. In fact, too many that I'm confused. I don't even know which one to give you. Seriously, I got so many that I'm confused. Here it is. This one's going to upset a lot of Muslims. I got a lot, man. I got about a dozen. But this one's going to upset a lot of Muslims. Allah, a schizophrenic deity who worships himself. Yeah, this might get me flagged. <laughs> really? Now, hey, Sam, uh, to be honest with you, to, um, before we started the stream, me and my friend Life, we saw that my part two debate with, with Uthman got demonetized. It got flagged. Well, brother, yeah. I'm already demonetized. I have no super chats. And by the way, to be honest with you, the worst thing you can do is have them give you super chat. Let them give you on PayPal. You know why? Because YouTube takes 30% of the super chats. Whoa. Really? Yeah. David Wood told me this years ago. They take 30% of the people of God's contributions to your ministry. PayPal takes much less. If they want to give you one time where they don't have to sign up for Patreon, do PayPal, brother. You don't need their super chat. Thanks for the advice and set that up. All right. So now, here's the article. I'm going to send it to you on Facebook, friend. All I right. got a lot. And by the way, in each article at the end, I usually link to other articles rebuttals. So let's talk about Allah praying. And who does he pray for? And who does he praise when he prays? Who does he praise when he prays? Oh, now, again, <laughs> now, but here's the thing, though. You have to be careful of Muslim translations. Many of them are dishonest and they don't translate accurately, okay? Therefore, let me now show you an accurate translation besides Usama Dakdok that's not accessible. Palmer, who wasn't a Muslim, who translated the Quran as accurately as he could, renders the Arabic correctly in 3343. So let's unpack these. You guys already know this. I know you know this. You've heard it. I've seen, I've seen you guys on videos using it. But let me show you how to make it more forceful if you don't know already. And we're creatures of repetition. We, when we hear something repetitively, it becomes second nature. 
by the grace of God's spirit. And we are better equipped and more enabled to go deeper into implications of these passages. So here, 33, 43. Here's the confusion. He it is who prays, you salli, from salah, for you and his angels too. So both Allah and angels perform salah. Now they'll tell you here it means blessing. No, there's an Arabic word for blessing. Baraka. Barakat, plural. So it can't mean blessing because there's a word for blessing. But here's where I'm really confused. And maybe you guys can help me understand this. He it is who prays for you and his angels too. And what do they pray for? What does Allah and angels pray when they pray for Muslims? Allah and his angels are praying to bring you forth out of the darkness into the light for his merciful to the believers. Now, okay, I'm, I'm baffled. Why does Allah need to pray to guide people out of darkness into light? Why doesn't he just do it? He's hopeless, that's why. Really? <laughs> So wait, you're telling me Allah's got to pray first. Oh Allah, yes. Please guide mankind out of darkness into light. Okay. But who's responding? Allah is. So Allah is responding to himself. Allah, yes Allah. Can you please guide them out of darkness into light? Sure Allah, I'll do that. Thank you Allah. See why I said it's a schizophrenic deity? <laughs> Uh, even on here, even Arbery uh, doesn't do it right. No, that's right. He doesn't. He was influenced by the Muslims, unfortunately. But it's Salli. Salah. Salawat is, is a plural, right? Salah, Salli. And I, in my articles, I quote Muslim scholars, Arabic lexicons to prove it. And I have a thorough response to Ibn Anwar, a.k.a. Ibn Underwear, who actually shut down his website. Glory to the triune God, and I want to give all glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. No glory to us may destroy my pride, but I'm stating a fact. Since we started writing articles for Answering Islam, and then I ventured into my own blog, before YouTube, everything was written rebuttals. There are Muslim websites that tried to refute us, and I, I'm proud to say this, and my pride is in the Father, Son, and Spirit for equipping us. All the major websites we shut down, they either stop writing or the websites vanished. Praise From God. answering Christianity, who had Basam Zawari, Sami Zatri, who started their own websites, they stopped writing because they couldn't handle the onslaught of destruction to their arguments in our polemic rebuttal section. Ibn An Anwar, when I went after him, his now his website, as of a month ago, is no longer online. It's gone. Let me double check to see if he's got back on. And I'll give you the thorough rebuttal I did to him on this issue of Allah praying. But let me first see if it's back on. Because a month ago I checked, it was gone. Okay. And Ibn Anwar is Ijaz Ahmed's fellow jihadi, partner in crime. He disappeared. Ibn Anwar left Islam several times. He was a Muslim who apostatized, returned to Islam, apostatized, returned to Islam. And I don't know, he may have apostatized again. He's unstable, right? Let me see if he's still online. I'll know because when I click to his article that I'm rebutting, I'll know. Here, let me see, Ibn Anwar. And the article is revisiting the issue of Allah's praying and worshiping like his creation. So this is my response to him. Let me find the link. All right, here it is. It's gone, his website's gone. See, he shut it down. He couldn't handle it. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Lord Jesus, Son of God. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Glory to you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the only true God. Keep equipping and filling us by the Spirit to glorify you and to walk worthy of you and love you and worship you in holiness in Jesus' name. We give him, the one true God, who's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all glory. So here's the rebuttal. Right? Here's the link. Let me get it for you on Facebook. Hold on. I love it. I love it. The rebuttal and the rebuttal to the rebuttal. That's good. Yeah. That's what the Lord put on my heart. In 1999, I had prayed for a sign. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if you want me to go to full-time ministry where I devote myself to glorifying you, teaching Christians the Bible and equipping them and destroying these cults like Islam, give me a sign. And he gave me the sign, and I've never looked back since then. I want to know what that sign was, Sam. 
Amen. That's one. Well, I'll, I'll give it to you later. Hold on. Let me just first. I, I lost my place. So I got to find you on Facebook. Hold on. Okay. Here it is. Here's the article. So, guys, I wrote these articles as a labor of love to glorify the Lord, to equip you. They're yours. You don't need to ask me. When people ask me, why do you think we wrote them? For you. So you can upload them, translate them, clip them, but you cannot sell them. We're giving it to you free. You do not make money off of our labor. If someone wants to give you a love offering, amen. If someone wants to support Avery and this other brother, that's fine. But you don't say, hey, I'll get five bucks. What five bucks? You got it for me, sucker. What are you charging for? All right? As our Lord said, freely you receive, freely you shall give. But then he also says, eat whatever they give you for the labor is worthy of his wages, his due. So let's go into Allah praying. Everyone got it? So far we got it, right? Yeah. And there I give you the Arabic lexicons and Muslim scholars who admit, here it is. Here, let me quote the Muslim scholar. And that rebuttal to Ibn Anwar, which I just gave to you. All right, here it is. And he's trying to refute me, by the way. And in trying to refute me, he makes my point. Look what he says. Ordinarily, the word salah, from which we get the word salah, does mean prayer or worship. He admits it. However, in the verse in question, when the word is ascribed to God and angels, it connotes the meaning of blessing and our forgiveness. Why? Did he give you any contextual reason for changing the meaning? When he just admits, it means prayer or worship. None. Why does it change in meaning? Why does it now mean blessing or forgiveness? And how do angels forgive? By praying to Allah to forgive. How do angels bless? By praying to Allah to bless. So you're still left with praying. Angels can't forgive or bless. They can only ask and pray to Allah to forgive and bless. Right? Everyone with me there? Now notice what he admits here. The word salah or salah in Arabic has a number of meanings to which it includes prayer, supplication, worship, blessing. No, it doesn't. Or praise and magnification. Okay? Now, do you want proof from authentic Muslim sources? The word salah and the plural, saliwat, do not mean blessing or mercy. You guys want proof? Yes, sir. In the article, I quote, Kadi Iyad Musa al-Yahsubi, my rebuttal to Ibn Anwar. In his book, al Shifaf Kadi Iyad, Muhammad Messenger of Allah, translated by Aisha Abdurrahman Buley. Okay? Page 25, a book recommended by Hamza Yusuf and other Sunni Muslims that Muslims must read. Look what he says. Look what he says. Does the word salah and the plural salawat mean blessing or mercy? Quote, Allah makes the merit of his prophet clear by first praying blessing on himself and then by the prayer of the angels and then by commanding his slaves to pray blessing and peace on him as well. He's talking about 3356, which we'll look at in a minute. Now watch, Abu Bakr ibn Furaq related that one of the ulama interpreted the words of the prophet, the coolness of my eye is in the prayer, as meaning Allah's prayer, that of the angels and that of his community in response to Allah's command until the day of rising. The prayer of angels and men is supplication for him and that of Allah's mercy. So when Allah prays, he prays to be merciful towards Muhammad. Now watch, quote, listen, it's not me, this is the Muslim jurist. It is said that they pray means they invoke blessing, baraka. That's what you heard Muslims telling you, right? It means blessing, right? You guys hear that all the time, right? Oh, pray means blessing, correct? You guys hear that, right? Yeah, that's what they tell us. That's right. That's yeah. Okay, here's the burial from their own Muslim jurist. However, when the prophet taught people the prayer in himself, he made a distinction between the word salah, prayer, and baraka, blessing. It's not the same. And I'll explain what prayer Muhammad taught them. We'll return to the meaning of prayer on him later. Now watch, page 250 of the same work. The prophet made a distinction between salah, prayer, and barakah, blessing, in the hadith in which he taught about making the prayer on him. This indicates that they have two separate meanings in your face. Well, wait, there's more. Page 257. Page 257. Same book? Yep, same book, and it's in that rebuttal to Ibn Anwar. Um, Sam, 
Uh, I was researching that very article that you wrote the other day, and I have a whole bunch more ahadith for you now that say that Allah prays in what he prays. Oh, what he prays. Nice. Yep. Yep, exactly. But now let's read what it says here on page 257. Salama al-Kindi said, Ali used to teach us the prayer on the Prophet as follows. Now watch how Muhammad taught them to pray. Oh Allah, the one who spread out the flat expanses, great heavens, bestow your noble prayers. And this is Aisha Buley translating it as noble prayers. Your increasing blessing and the compassion of your tenderness upon Muhammad. Do you see? Three different words. Bestow your noble prayers, your increasing blessing, barakah, and the compassion, rahmah. So notice, in this saying, Muhammad uses salah, Barakah and Rahmah, all in the same sentence, showing they don't mean the same thing. You got it? Yes, sir. Muhammad said, Allah, bestow your prayers, increase your blessing and the compassion of your tenderness. So wait, that means blessing and compassion of his tenderness cannot mean the same as prayer. Because he's using all three words in the same sentence to mean three different things. Yeah. <clears throat> Continuing. Ali also said about the prayer on the Prophet in the ayat, Allah and his angel, angels pray on the Prophet. That's 3356. Watch here, quote Ali, at your servants and obedience, my Lord, the prayers of Allah, the good and the merciful, the near angels, the true ones, the martyrs, the sarihun, <coughs> and anything that glorifies you, O Lord of the worlds, be upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Notice Aisha Buli renders the word as prayer. Yep. Finally, page 258. If that didn't show you, it doesn't mean the same thing as blessing or mercy. <clears throat> Here you go. Ibn Masood, Muhammad's companion, used to say, when you bless the prophet, then make the prayer on him excellent. You do not know, perhaps it will be shown to him. Now watch. Say, O Allah, bestow your prayers, your mercy and your blessing in your face. All three words used in the same sentence. Salah, Rahma, Baraka. Allah bestow your Salah, your Rahma, your Baraka. So how can they mean the same thing? On the master of the messengers, the Imam of the God fearing, the leader of the good, and the messengers of mercy. Now, when Muhammad told them to pray for him during the five daily prayers, now a lot of people don't know this. In the next part, I'll mention how Muslims pray to Muhammad in their five daily prayers. It's called Tashahud. Tashahud, five times a day, the Muslims must perform tashahud in their prayer where they speak to Muhammad and say, Assalamu alayka ahyu nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and the mercies and blessings of Allah on you as well. They're talking to a dead man directly in their prayer. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. Because here, Muhammad says, when you pray for me, here's how you pray. This comes from <clears throat> Tafsir Ibn Kathir on chapter 33, verse 56. Here's where he quotes Muhammad saying, here's how you pray for me. You want to fulfill 33, 56? Here's how you obey that command that says you must pray for me. So I quote, <clears throat> sorry guys, my voice. <clears throat> I'm getting old. Pray the Lord Jesus will guard my throat. Keep it healthy. Because you know Satan's going to attack any part of us to stop us from glorifying him. Now watch here. Allah, messenger, taught them the prayer. How do you pray for Muhammad? Well, here's what Muhammad says. The command to say Salah on the Prophet. Al-Bukhari said, Abu Al-Aliyah said, Allah's Salah. Now guys, here's where Allah can it's shirk. Allah's salah is his praising him before the angels. And the salah of the angels is their supplication. Did you catch it? Allah prays by praising Muhammad before the angels. So in Allah's prayers, he's praising Muhammad. Tell me that's not shirk. That's not worship. That's worse than, than that. You have, you have God supposedly praying and at the same time uplifting praising someone else in his own prayer that, and he's doing it in front of the angels yeah that's that's sick to understand because when you ask the muslims when you pray do you pray 
praise Allah? Yes. When Allah prays, who is he praising? Muhammad. And he's praising him before the angels. So the angels are hearing Allah praising Muhammad in his prayer. Okay? Now let's move on. Okay? Let's move on. <clears throat> Ibn Abbas said, they send blessings. The angels send blessings by evoking Allah to bless. Okay? That's basically what it's saying. Abu Isa at Tirmidhi said, this was narrated from Sufyan at Thawri and other scholars said, <clears throat> the Salah of the Lord is mercy and the Salah of the angels is there seeking forgiveness. What it means is, Allah prays to himself to show you mercy. And the angels pray to Allah to forgive. There are mutawatir hadiths, multiply attested hadiths, <clears throat> narrated from the Messenger of Allah, commanding us to send blessings on him, and how we should say salah upon him. We will mention as many of them as we can, if Allah will, and Allah is the one whose help we seek. Now watch. In his tafsir <clears throat> of this ayah, this verse, 3356, Al-Bukhari recorded that Kaab ibn Ujra said, it was said, O Messenger of Allah, with regard to sending salam, sending peace upon you, we know about this. But how about salah? In other words, how do we pray for you? Watch guys, in Muhammad's instruction to pray for him, he uses the word salah and barakah. Barakat, plural, <clears throat> in the same sentence, Showing that salah, prayer, doesn't mean the same thing as blessing. Here you go. Muhammad says, say, O Allah, send your salah upon Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your salah, salita, upon the family of Ibrahim. <clears throat> Verily, you are the most praise praiseworthy, most glorious. Now notice the second part of how to pray for Muhammad. O Allah, <clears throat> send your blessings upon Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your blessings upon the family of Ibrahim. Ver verily you are most praiseworthy, most glorious. Did you catch it? In <clears throat> the teaching of Muhammad, showing his followers how to pray for him, he told them, say to Allah, Allah, Send your salah on Muhammad and his family like you sent your salah on Abraham and his family. And Allah, send your blessings on Muhammad and his family as you sent your blessings on Abraham's family. But wait, I thought salah means blessings. But here, Muhammad said, ask Allah to do both. Send me his salah and his barakat, his blessings. Meaning they don't mean the same thing. Everyone got it or no? Before right, I move on. Sam, hold on, let me... Uh... I'm going to try to find, I've seen that hadith, the actual hadith. Yep, it's uh, in Bukhari. Mm -hmm. Let me try to see if I can get it in a pen or something like that. So I gave you Muslim sources, authentic Muslim sources, Bukhari and others, that prove salah, the word for prayer, does not mean blessing. The word blessing is baraka, plural, barakat. Nor does Salah mean mercy, Rahma. And you know what proves that the word Salah doesn't mean mercy? You know where you find the proof of it? Does anyone know where? Where? In the Quran itself. Yeah. In 2157. In 2157, it uses both the words Salawat and Rahma. Salawat is plural, it means prayers, and Rahma means mercy. Here it is, 2.157, taken from a Muslim translation. Muhammad Mahmoud Ghali, here's the link, you can read it online. Muhammad Mahmoud Ghali, chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah 157. Here it is. Here's the link, and I'm going to send it to you now. Okay. I keep losing you, man. Right here. I know, you're there, but I'm saying I, I know, but I'm right here. Okay, I'll see. never go nowhere, man. I'm right here, baby. All right, man, that's right. It's your world, baby. Or a squirrel. Squirrel! There you go. Okay, now, let's read how this Muslim translates the two words. Salawat, which is plural for prayers, and Rahma. Here you go. 2.157. <clears throat> Upon those are the prayers from the Lord and mercy. Salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmatun. Prayers and mercy, Allah's prayers and mercy, proving they don't mean the same thing. And those are they who are the right guided. 
A few more examples of Allah praying and we're going to wrap it up. Okay? Here you go. 3356. 3356 from Palmer. From Palmer. Verily, God, Allah, and His angels pray. You saloon. You saluna ala nabi. Like Muhammad Hajab said. See, I knew I had to give you a free Arabic lesson, boy. I'm your teacher, boy. It doesn't say pray to, it says pray for. <clears throat> God and his angels pray for the prophet. O you who believe, pray, sallu for him, and salute him with a salutation. Now, notice that this is shirk. Why is this shirk? Notice that Allah is part of a company that prays. Allah and the angels are performing this act, this verb, this action. Allah and the angels are performing salah. So Allah is joined with the angels, the angels are joined with Allah in praying for Muhammad. Incredible. So now you ask a Muslim, when the angels perform salah, what are they doing? Pray. Then it says to the believers, you pray as well. Sallu. You perform salah. So how do the believers perform salah? They pray. And who are the angels praying for? Muhammad. Who are believers praying for? Muhammad. Ah, but hold on. It says Allah is joining the angels in performing this action of Salah. Allah and the angels, you saluna. Allah with the angels is performing this action. So then how can the definition of the word change if you admit that when angels perform Salah, they're praying for Muhammad. When believers are performing Salah, they're praying for Muhammad. So when the same verb is used of Allah, and Allah is performing the same action with angels, how does the definition change? Allah. But now watch why this is such a problem. It's encouraging Muslims to pray for Muhammad. And here's why. Muslims, Muhammad is so important that even Allah and the angels are praying for him. How much more should you be praying if even Allah and the angels pray for him? In other words, Muhammad has now become the focus of the attention of the universe. He's now the focus of Allah and the angels and believers because all of them are busying themselves praying for Muhammad. Oh no, but Sam, Muhammad barely is barely mentioned in the Quran. No, Jesus is mentioned more than Muhammad. All right. Sucks <laughs> being, sucks being Muhammadans. Now the Hadiths, if you want proof that Allah performs the same action, which is prayer that creatures do, here you go. It's so all in that article, Allah's schizophrenic deity, and I link to the other articles and rebuttals in these articles. Aisha Buli, Riyadh Salihin, The Meadows of the Righteous, which was compiled by Imam Nawawi, who was the commentator of Sai Muslim, Shah Sai Muslim. Book of Knowledge, chapter 241, The Excellence of Knowledge. Now watch, Hadith number 1387. Abu Umama. Reported that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah, now watch, and his angels, and the people of the heavens, and the earth, even the ants and the rocks, and the fish, pray for blessings on those who teach people good. At Tirmidhi. So wait, it's not just Allah. Allah is performing the same action with angels, the people of the heavens and the earth, ants and rocks and fish. So which Muslim would deny that the word pray literally means angels, the peoples on the earth, ants, and fish are praying. No Muslim. So then why would you deny that Allah is literally praying when he's joining all of the rest in performing this action? Is that a problem? Okay. Here's another hadith. This is from... <clears throat> Jami at Tirmidhi, <clears throat> number 2685. It's Hassan, and you can read online. Abu Umama al Bahili narrated two men were mentioned before the Messenger of Allah, one of them a worshiper and the other a scholar. So the Messenger of Allah said, The superiority of the scholar over the worshippers, like my superiority over the least of you. Then the Messenger of Allah said, Indeed, Allah, His angels, 
the heavens of the heavens and the earth, even the end and the soul, even the fish, say, Salah, upon the one who teaches the people to do good. You can't get around this, guys. Impossible. Abu Isa said, this hadith is Hassan, Gharib, Sahih. Man, you can't get around this, guys. It's over. Now, let me read a few more, and we'll wrap it up. And we'll do a part four, I promise, because I got a lot more, guys. I'm just scratching the surface, but guys, I need your prayers. Pray for me faithfully, guys. I do need them. Pray for me, my daughters, their mother. That's the Lord to grant us divine, supernatural, miraculous, physical health, safety, protection, especially for me, that my throat stays perfectly healthy so that I can use my voice. So always glorify the Lord, bless you, and destroy these cults. Pray the Lord for the provision needed to glorify him, that I truly walk worthy of the Lord and obey the Lord and love the Lord, not be a hypocrite. Pray my daughters are reconciled to me and that they fall in love with Jesus. And I see them grow up with the Lord Terry. So I need those prayers, guys. Now, let's wrap it up with a few more. This is the English translation of Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Now, sadly, Darus Salaam did not include it in their abridged English translation of Tafsir Ibn Kathir, and you'll see why. But I got it translated. So if you guys have the Arabic Tafsir Ibn Kathir like Coptic does, he can read the Arabic and confirm. His exposition of 3356 includes the following. The people of Israel said to Moses, does your Lord pray? Does he pray? His Lord called them saying, oh Moses, oh Musa, they asked you if your Lord prays. So notice Allah said, no, I only send blessings. Not say to them, yes, I do pray. And my angels pray upon my prophet's messengers. And Allah then sent down on his messenger this verse. Allah and his angels pray. So what did Allah say? No, stupid. I only said barakah, rahmah. Tell them, yes, I do pray. Same hadith found in another source. This comes from Al-Ahadith al qudsiya Holy Narrations, where Muhammad is narrating the words of Allah. Divine Narratives. Translated by Dr. Abdul Khad Qazi and Dr. Alan B. Day, Saniya bil Ahadith al Qudsiya by Sheikh Zain al Din Abdul Abdul Rauf bin Taj al Arafin bin Al bin Zain al Abadin al Munawi. Say that five times fast. Pages 305 306. Hadith number 216. The Israelites said to Musa, Does your Lord pray? <clears throat> Musa said, Fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, Oh Musa, what did your people say? Musa said, Oh my Lord, you already know. They said, Does your Lord pray? So Allah said, Stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. I don't pray. Not, here's what he said. Allah said, Tell them, my prayer for my mercy servants that my mercy should precede my anger. So notice Allah's praying. And he says to himself, Self, Nafsi. My mercy overcomes my anger. So yes, Allah prays. And you're told what Allah prays. Allah prays to himself to remind himself, Oh Allah, my mercy proceeds, overcomes my anger. Can you believe it? Allah is praying to himself. A little bit, brother. Saying to himself, Allah, which was, which was, which was breaking up. You're breaking up. You're breaking up a little no, bit. No, sir. I don't break up, man. I don't break with anyone. Hold on, guys. One second. Haters. Hey, man, it's them gins, man. They don't like Get what you're saying. No. Yeah, it's, it's, you're going to have to talk a little bit to see if we You better go. stop, sir. Don't you tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> okay, is it good? Yeah, it's good. It's okay. Good. So this is the same hadith narrated in another collection. And Allah says... To Moses, I do pray, and here's what I pray. Guys, notice, Allah's telling him, Moses, what he prays. And so Allah prays, my mercy overcomes my wrath. So can you believe it? Allah prays to himself, tells himself, my mercy overcomes my wrath. So Allah actually needs to remind himself by praying to himself, Allah, remember, my mercy overcomes my wrath. Oh my goodness, dude. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have destroyed them. Here it is. Here it is. Let me show you. So Allah, do you pray? Yes, I pray. When you pray, what do you say to yourself? Here's what I say. My mercy 
should precede my anger, overcome my wrath. If we're not so, I would have destroyed them. So Allah needs to pray to himself as a reminder, self, nafsi, my soul, don't be so angry. Make sure your mercy overcomes your anger, lest you destroy them. Final one. This comes from Ibn Shams Al Sira Al Halabiya. And I give you the Arabic. Al Sira Al Halabiya. Muhammad said, Oh Gabriel, does your Lord pray? He said, Yes. I said, What does he say? This is what he says. He says, Glory, holy, Lord of the angels and the spirit, my mercy overcomes my wrath. See, I wasn't lying. That's what he prays. But notice he also glorifies himself. He says to himself, Glory, holy, you're the Lord of the angels and the spirit. And my mercy overcomes my wrath. Incredible. Now, let me give you a chronic verse. And then, Lord willing, in part four, we will do more on this and then show how Allah not only prays, but Muslims pray to Muhammad and thereby worship Muhammad. And Allah allows them to pray to Muhammad directly. And then we'll get into the Quran and the Black Stone, Lord willing. We got too much. But I want you to see... We're going to look at one verse and one surah in its entirety. We're going to wrap it up with this. How Allah is praising himself, praying to himself, worshiping himself in the Quran. Because remember, the Muslims say the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is not Muhammad's words re reporting what Allah inspired him to say. The Quran is purely, only, solely the speech of Allah. Okay. And it's uncreated. More on that in part four. Go to chapter 17, verse one of the Quran. Read that for me. Chapter 13. Mm -mm. I said 17, sir. Yeah, that, that's what I said. Uh, yeah, sorry. I heard you. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> chapter 17, verse number one. One. Oh, verse number one. Yeah. Our favorite verse. All right. <laughs> Here we are. It says, reading the Arbery translation, Glory be to him who carried his servant by night from the holy mosque to the further mosque, the precincts of which we have blessed, that we might show him some of our signs. Can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. Okay, finish it, finish it. Go ahead, I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> he is the all hearing, the all seeing. Okay, now who's speaking this verse? Allah is speaking. Who said glory be to him? Mm, Allah did. So Allah just glorified himself and praised himself? Yes. Everyone and, caught it? And, and, and Allah is Allah's servant. Yeah. Well, did you catch it? Yes. Allah glorifies himself. And he does it all throughout the Quran. He is glorifying himself, saying to himself, praise be to you. Praise be to him, glory be to you, glory be to him, all throughout the Quran. Yeah. See that? All right, now, let's go to Surah Al-Fatiha. All right. Chapter 1, verses, first, it's only seven verses. I say first seven, it's only seven, so all of them. Now, watch here, though. Remember, Surah Al-Fatiha, chapter 1 of the Quran, is supposed to be uncreated. It's supposed to be eternal beginningless and remember i read the hadith where allah recited the quran <clears throat> recited taha yasin a thousand years before the creation of the heavens and the earth yes okay now watch surah al-fatiha and according to the authentic traditions abdullah ibn masood guys hear me out abdullah ibn masood one of the four men that muhammad said learned the quran directly from and it's found in bukhari and muslim and he started with abdullah ibn masood Abdullah bin Sud rejected Surah Al-Fatiha and the last two surahs, 113-14, and did not include them in his Quran. So his Quran only had 111 chapters. One tradition has 110. Because he said these were prayers that you pray. They're not surahs, part of the speech of Allah. And he rejected them. Ubay bin Ka'ab disagreed, included them, but also included two additional surahs. So he had 116 surahs in his Quran. So two of the four men that Muhammad said learned the Quran from couldn't agree over the exact contents of the Quran. Now you're going to see why Abdullah bin Masood didn't want this surah in the Quran. Because if it's the speech of Allah, Kalam Allah, and it's uncreated, 
That means Allah is worshiping himself, praying to himself, and asking himself to guide himself. Read it slowly. All right. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Now, some debate whether this is part of the surah. Some debate that. So we're not going to focus on that. Okay. Praise belongs to God, the Lord of all being. Who's saying that? Allah is. So Allah, in eternity before creation, the, the surah that you read is supposedly his speech, and his speech is uncreated. So in eternity, part of Allah's speech included reciting these words to himself. Yeah. So what did Allah say to himself? He said, praise belongs to God. Keep going. The Lord of all being, the all merciful, the all compassionate, the master of the day of judgment. The only we serve. Wait, so Allah is saying the only we serve? Yeah. We, the plural, again? I guess it's the plural of majesty, we guess. So if Surah Al-Fatiha is eternal, it's part of Allah's speech, that means this is a part of the speech that Allah must be speaking. It's his speech. He speaks it. These are his words. He speaks these words. But these words are prayers and worship. So Allah is saying what? He's saying, you alone we serve. And what else? And you alone we ask for aid. Allah needs aid and help from someone? <laughs> yes. So Allah is saying to someone, we serve you only only we worship you only and we ask your help your aid alone but what else does allah say he also says guide us in the straight path the path of those whom you have blessed not of those against whom you are wrathful nor of those who are astray okay now i'm really confused Allah said, guide us on the straight path. So why does Allah need to be guided on the straight path and who can guide him? That's number one. But then he mentions those whom Allah is angry with, wrathful at, and those who've been <clears throat> led astray. If this is an eternal speech and it's part of Allah's eternal words, so that means Allah has been speaking these words because this is a speech and if it's a speech, then he speaks it. Yes. Who in the world is Allah referring to in eternity as those who've gotten Allah angry and have gone astray when no one besides Allah exists? Yeah. Can you help me understand that? I don't get it. No, I cannot. I can't help you. Can I read verse 6 again? Verse 6. Guide us in the straight path. Okay, so Allah is saying praying uttering these words because these are his words his speech quran is uncreated guide us so there's a group that allah represents on the straight path now let me prove to you that allah is on a straight path you want proof of it you want to really get blown away i want to really get blown away yes. 11 56 of the quran chapter 11 verse 56. all right allah muhammad's lord is on a straight path like muslims so that here, when it says, guide us on a straight path, that's actually Allah asking to be on a straight path, literally. Because here's the proof, 1156. All right. It says, truly, I have put my trust in God, my Lord, and your Lord. There is no creature that crawls, but he takes it by the forelock. Surely, my Lord is on a straight path. Surah Al-Mustaqim. So my Lord Allah is on a straight path. So he's not like Jesus, who is the straight path, who brings you to heaven. He is like Muslims. He's on a straight path like they are. Wow. Did it sink in, guys? I don't know. It's like everyone's silent. That sunk in, man. That's... Allah is on the that's straight what? path. Someone said something. I heard someone's that. What was that? Allah is crazy. 
Okay. Did you catch it? No, I didn't. I didn't. It's 11.56. My Lord is on a straight path. So notice, Allah is not like Jesus, who is the straight path, who is the way, who brings you to glory. Allah is like Muslims. He's on the straight path like them. So that confirms that in Surah 1, verse 6, it's Allah praying, guide me and those whom I'm speaking for on a straight path. Yes. But then we're left with who in the world are those who have earned Allah's wrath and have gone astray in eternity before creation when no one besides Allah exists. Mm -hmm. Now, a Muslim will tell you, well, that's because this prayer has in mind the creatures that Allah would create. Those creatures who'd rebel, which according to the authentic traditions of Jibreel Muhammad are the Jews and Christians. Muhammad said, those who've earned the wrath of Allah are Jews. Those who've gone astray are Christians. That's in the authentic hadith. That's how he interprets chapter 1, verse 7. That's why in the Halali Khan version, they put in brackets, parentheses, Jews, Christians. Because the hadith has Muhammad saying, those who've earned Allah's wrath are the Jews, and those who've gone astray are Christians. So five times a day, Muslims are praying to Allah, don't make us Jews or Christians. But if that's the case, that this surah anticipates creatures that would exist, creatures who'd go astray like Christians and creatures who earn others wrath like Jews, then we're left with one of two problems. Now I need you to listen to this because we're going to wrap up. We're left with one of two problems. That either means Allah already predestined that there'd be Jews and Christians and others who would fall from his favor and earn his wrath in order to make this surah a reality. So these Jews and Christians had no choice. They were created to do the very thing that the surah envisions them doing. In the case of Jews, earning Allah's wrath. In the case of Christians, going astray. So they're predestined for destruction. Or it means that Allah knew that Jews and Christians, not all, but those Jews and those Christians who diso disobey, would end up earning his wrath in the case of Jews and be led astray in the case of Christians and therefore had no choice but to create them because if he didn't create them, then this part of the surah would never become realized, actualized. It would only exist in potentiality. You see the problem? Yeah. In other words, if Allah didn't predestine them, then he had to create them and he wasn't free not to create them because he needed these Jews and Christians to exist to make this surah a reality. So Allah is dependent on creatures, needs creatures to make his speech a reality that becomes actualized by the creation of creatures who will do what his speech envisioned them doing. So he's not free not to create them. He needs them. This was, uh, this was heavy. Did you guys understand the implication? Either he predestined them to wrath and destruction and to fall astray, to be led astray, because Allah does mislead, or it's Allah knowing that there'd be creatures that he would create who would end up earning his wrath and going astray, and therefore those creatures he had to necessarily create in order to actualize this part of his prayer, otherwise his prayer would never become actualized and therefore would be nullified because that prayer would never become reality. So he's not free not to create them. Right. You're stuck, Muslims. You just buried your deen. And we're done. Alhamdulillah. All ham to Allah, brother. Okay.